years ago when McConnell effectively blocked President Obama's pick. Why he says it's different this time around. Democrats are outraged. Why not just come to the floor and say, I'm going to do what's ever best for my political party. Consistency be damned, reason be damned, democracy be damned. Just admit it. The epic battle in the days and weeks to come. President Trump reveals today five women are being vetted, and he promises an announcement Friday or Saturday. Meanwhile, Joe Biden insists the next president should pick the next Supreme Court justice. Remembering RBG, the tributes pouring in all the Ginsburg, now set to be the first woman ever to lie in state at the U.S. Capitol. The CDC causing confusion, abruptly removing guidance on how the coronavirus spreads through airborne transmission, and how Dr. Anthony Fauci is trying to ease fears tonight. Tropical storm Beta bringing heavy rain to the Gulf Coast, flash flooding fears as more than a foot of rain is expected. The election protection hotline working in overdrive this season will take you behind the scenes as our democracy finds itself under threat. This would be the nerve center of the election protection hotline in an ordinary election. In an ordinary election, but these are not ordinary times. And finding faith in the toughest of times, the staggering loss of life, 200,000 souls in this country alone, how we're handling the suffering, and finding the strength to forge on our roundtable discussion with different faith leaders. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Equal parts grief and reverence in the wake of RBG's passing. And now two very distinct calls for action. What should come next depends on who you ask. In the interim, Justice Ginsburg will lie in repose at the Supreme Court on Wednesday and Thursday and lie in state at the U.S. Capitol, the first woman to ever receive that honor. A memorial for the 87-year-old is growing tonight in front of the Supreme Court. And inside, the very seat where she delivered opinions and dissents that fundamentally changed our democracy, now draped in black, a champion of gender equality, a fierce advocate for voting rights, and the liberal rock of the court. Tonight, the debate over who will select the next occupant of this seat is igniting a political firestorm that could have profound implications on the outcome of the election and beyond. President Trump is promising a female nominee by the end of the week, but Democrats are calling out Republicans, accusing them of hypocrisy. Our Jonathan Carl leads us off with the brewing battle ahead. On the steps of the Supreme Court, the tributes are coming in. Inside, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat is draped in black. Outside, the political battle to replace her is already well underway. About 24 hours after her death, President Trump appeared before supporters who were chanting, fill that seat. <laughs> he promised he would and that his nominee will be a woman. It will be a woman, a very talented, very brilliant woman. NPR reported that Justice Ginsburg dictated a final statement to her granddaughter. One sentence long, it read, My most fervent wish is that I will not be replaced until a new president is installed. Today, President Trump implied the statement was a fake, crafted by Democrats. So that came out of the wind. Let's see. I mean, maybe she did and maybe she did. He said he's going to announce a nominee by the end of the week. Well, I'd much rather have a vote uh, before the election because there's a lot of work to be done. The president says he is considering five candidates. Sources involved in the process tell ABC News there are two at the top of the list, both now federal judges, Amy Coney Barrett and Barbara Lagoa. He met with Coney Barrett today at the White House. She is from Indiana and a former law clerk for Justice Antonin Scalia. She is a devout Catholic with seven kids and is strongly supported by anti-abortion activists. Her faith came up at her confirmation hearing for her current post. The dogma lives loudly within you. And that's of concern when you come to big issues. Coney Barrett insisted she wouldn't let her personal views affect how she interprets the law. It's never appropriate for a judge to impose that judge's personal convictions, whether they derive from faith or anywhere else on the law. Barbara Lagoa is a former chief justice of the Florida Supreme Court. She was born in Miami. Her parents fled Castro's Cuba. The president seems to think picking her could be a popular move in a state he must win. She's excellent. She's Hispanic. She's uh, 
a terrific woman from everything I know. I don't know her. Uh, Florida. We love Florida. So she's got a lot of things very smart. Joe Biden is urging Republicans to hold off on replacing Justice Ginsburg until after the election. Among the things he says are in the balance, Obamacare, with its protections for people with pre-existing conditions. The Supreme Court will hear a challenge to the law just one week after the election. And the people of this nation are choosing their future right now as they vote. To jam this nomination through the Senate is just an exercise in raw political power. And Jonathan Carl joins us now from Washington. John, President Trump hopes that this looming battle will boost his campaign, but Democrats also sense an opportunity to fire up their own base. I mean, on one hand, the president and his allies certainly welcome a headline that is not about coronavirus, but there is no question that this is already really energizing Democrats, including some Democrats who are less than overly enthusiastic about Joe Biden. I, I think that ultimately the impact is unclear, but this much is certain. It has intensified interest, Lindsay, in a presidential campaign where interest is really already off the charts. Indeed. All right, Jonathan. Carl reporting in from Washington tonight. Thanks, John. Thanks, Lindsay. And on Capitol Hill tonight, both sides are preparing for a bruising political confirmation fight. In the Senate today, Mitch McConnell vowing to hold a vote with less than 45 days to go until the election. Now, back in 2016, with nine months to go until the election, McConnell did not allow a floor vote for President Obama's nominee, Merrick Garland. But at this moment, when a possible vote would take place is anyone's guess. Mary Bruce is on Capitol Hill with the very latest. On the Senate floor today, Republican leader Mitch McConnell with an unequivocal the promise. The Senate will vote on this nomination this year. But that's not the position he took in 2016 when he refused to consider President Obama's pick to fill Justice Scalia's seat months before the election. Let's let the American people decide. McConnell now says this is different because the Senate and the White House are both controlled by Republicans. But Senator Lindsey Graham, as recently as two years ago, said Republicans would not take up a Supreme Court vacancy in an election year. Year, no matter what. If an opening comes in the last year of President Trump's term and the primary process is started, we'll wait to the next election. And I've got a pretty good chance of being the judiciary. You're on the record. Yeah. All right. Hold the tape. But now, despite the tape, he's calling for the Judiciary Committee to quickly consider the president's nominee, telling Democrats, I am certain if the shoe were on the other foot, you would do the same. Democrats say it's blatant hypocrisy. Why well, say it's this rule or that rule, and then do the exact opposite when it suits your interests? Why not just come to the floor and say, I'm going to do what's ever best for my political party. Consistency be damned, reason be damned, democracy be damned. Just admit it. Four Republicans would have to break ranks and join Democrats to block a confirmation. So far, two senators, Susan Collins of Maine and Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, both say this decision should be up to the next president. And Mary Bruce joins us now. Mary, got to imagine that Mitt Romney is in there as one who could possibly break ranks with their colleagues. Who else might be among that group? And if that does not happen, do Democrats have any power to stop the confirmation? And Mitt Romney certainly is feeling some pressure here. He, of course, famously voted to impeach the president earlier this year. So a lot of eyes on him and wondering how he is going to play this. Also, Cory Gardner, he is up for re-election in Colorado. That is a state that Trump lost. And voting on this before an election could potentially hurt him politically. We also just heard moments ago from Senator Chuck Grassley. He was someone who is considered to be a possible swing vote. But tonight, he is making it clear he supports moving ahead with the confirmation process, saying in a statement, make no mistake, if the shoe were on the other foot, Senate Democrats wouldn't hesitate to use their constitutional authority and anything else at their disposal to fill this seat. As for what Democrats can do, Lindsay, they simply do not have much power here. The best tool they have at their disposal is to try to pressure these key Republican senators who may be potentially on the fence and simply to try to delay the process. Lindsay. It will be contentious indeed. Mary Bruce, thanks so much for reporting in from the nation's capital. Thank you. And to further drill down on the judges on President Trump's shortlist and how a Trump appointment could reshape our laws, we bring in Cordoza law professor and former Supreme Court clerk Deborah Pearlstein. Thanks so much for joining us, Professor. 
Good to be with you. So let's start with Judge Amy Coney Barrett. What do we know about her judicial record and also her thoughts on hot button issues like abortion, the Affordable Care Act, and voting laws if there's to be a contested election? So uh, Judge Barrett hasn't been on the bench for very long, but she has been on the federal bench since 2017. Uh, she was a Scalia clerk herself when she was in the Supreme Court, and before she served as a judge, she was an academic. So while she hasn't been on the bench for very long, her paper trail is pretty rich. She published a lot as an academic. Um, and I think there are a few things we can probably reliably say. I mean, she's certainly a conservative Catholic, uh, and, and based on her sort of confirmation hearings and other statements, seems like quite reliably um, uh, doesn't support sort of a right to abortion necessarily. It's unclear whether she would vote to overturn Roe versus Wade, but she has written directly on the principle of stare decisis, that is, can the Supreme Court, how bound is the Supreme Court by its own prior decisions? And she's taken a position in her academic writing um, that, in fact, the Supreme Court should feel less bound um, than it has historically by prior decisions. So all of those uh, things are alarm bells for people who uh, would be worried about Roe versus Wade. Uh, beyond that, she describes herself, her husband described as an originalist um, and, and, and somebody who strictly adheres to the text of both the Constitution and statute. Statutes. Um, I think as a pretty reliable conservative, she's likely to vote with the conservative bloc on questions like um, uh, statutes like the Affordable Health Care Act and, and the like. Um, so it's, it's harder to say when it comes to statutory interpretation a little bit, um, but I think conservatives view her as a very solid vote um, for particularly on the social issues they worry most about. And, and that same question, but directed at uh, Judge Barbara Lagoa, who spent far less time than Judge Coney Barrett on the federal bench. What might we expect from her? Absolutely. So Barbara Lagoa has been on the federal bench for less than a year. She served on the Florida Supreme Court also for less than a year um, and, and on Florida state courts before that. Um, and before her career as a judge, she was a federal prosecutor. So there's much less, not only many fewer opinions to look at. She's issued quite few since she's been on the 11th Circuit for less than a year. Um, she doesn't have the same sort of record of academic writing that we have uh, for Amy Coney Barrett. So it's much harder to discern. Uh, sort of exactly what her views are. Now, that said, I think there are some themes that emerge, right? She seems to be known as, and her opinions are consistent with somebody who is pretty reliably pro-business. Um, most of her cases on the federal bench so far have been in criminal law, federal sentencing, and certainly with her background as a federal prosecutor, one might imagine um, her views uh, uh, remain relatively pro-prosecution um, as well. Um, I think it's, again, harder to say based on her judicial opinions how it is she would vote on not so much economic issues, but the social issues like abortion um, that that remain such hot button issues uh, for conservatives and the rest of the country. And, and let's talk about all that's at stake here. The Supreme Court has certainly had uh, conservative majorities before, but now we could see a six to three split. How transformative would that be for the court and the country? Yeah, it's a great question and a really complicated one. I think the stakes for the court uh, are pretty high before and really for decades now, while it's been quite a conservative court, there's been at least one swing vote. So you had circumstances where there could be negotiation between the relatively more conservative justices and the relatively more liberal justices over a single justice's vote. And it had the effect of often, certainly with Justice Kennedy, now again, we see with uh, Chief Justice Roberts, empowering a single uh, uh, more moderate view um, as, as, as sort of the decisive factor on the court. Without the need to negotiate with a more solid uh, majority in one direction or another, uh, there's a risk that the court will be less cautious, um, will overturn more precedents, will move more quickly, uh, will be less concerned about institutional issues. Uh, and so that's a set of questions that, uh, to the extent these nominees, whoever's nominated, comes before the Senate, um, a confirmation process would 
would certainly want to focus on. More broadly for the country, uh, we've been focused on the current court and for the last decades about how likely it is that presidents like Roe versus Wade, cases from the 1960s and 70s, um, will survive. But with a very solid conservative majority, a sort of six to three, um, and justices already on the bench who are known to want to um, elevate uh, the rights of corporations and property and reduce the ability and the power of the federal government to engage in regulation through administrative agencies like the environmental, um, uh, like uh, the EPA, the FDA, the, red, the, the rest of the federal agencies, we could see precedents going back to the 1930s really um, start to be called into question. And that's a transformation we haven't seen on the court for a long time. Professor Prolstein, thank you so much for your insight. We really greatly appreciate that. Thank you. And now to the latest on the coronavirus. As we get closer to that milestone, no one wanted nor imagined 200,000 American lives lost and case numbers continue to grow in dozens of states. To keep ourselves safe, how far apart should we be from other people? Well, initially we were told six feet. Then the CDC suggested that's not far enough. Now they're giving us more mixed messages. ABC's Steve Osinsami tries to make sense of it all. It's a heartbreaking figure. Scientists at Johns Hopkins University are reporting this evening that nearly 200,000 Americans have now lost their lives to the coronavirus. The president today in a phone interview says his response has mostly been very good. On public relations, I give myself a D. On the job itself, we take an A+. Plus. Joe Biden was in Wisconsin today giving the president failing grades. He failed to act. He panicked. And America's paid the worst price of any nation in the world. Today, the flip-flop of information from the CDC continued, which isn't helping people trust this important agency. On Friday, they finally acknowledged what some scientists have been arguing for months, posting updated guidelines saying that tiny droplets with the virus can travel more than six feet in certain settings like choir practices, restaurants, or gyms with limited ventilation. We've known for months that COVID is transmitted when people cough or sneeze, but also when they talk and breathe and uh, through aerosols. This afternoon, the CDC took it all back, saying this was posted in error. You know, I apologize on behalf of CDC for that. Uh, we weren't ready to put it up. The quality of information from these agencies becomes more important as the weather gets colder. The number of cases is growing in 29 states and the island of Puerto Rico. See, the American people rely on the CDC for clear guidance, including how the virus is transmitted. And this flip-flopping, which clearly is about political interference in the scientific process, I think makes it much harder for Americans to know what the right things are, what they need to do to keep themselves safe. And let's now bring in Steve Osinsami. Steve, do we know when the CDC might publish new guidelines? We're not sure at this point. They're, they're not saying where they're going to, when they're going to release these new guidelines. But one thing that public health experts do tell us that all of this underlines, Lindsay, whether it's six feet or 16 feet that the tiny droplets spread, this points out that wearing a mask indoors is really the best suggestion. Lindsay? And Steve, from what you're hearing, those who work at the CDC describe themselves as really being in an impossible position. You know, it, it's truly impossible. You can't see it or hear it right now because we're on the other side of the building. But on the other side of the CDC near the main entrance, there is a protest taking place right now. About a couple dozen people who are outside holding signs, essentially protesting the president's involvement in the CDC. A lot of the people who work here complain that they are frustrated, that they've never felt so politicized. These are career scientists who feel that their work and their credibility is being jeopardized by all the back and forth and by all the influence that they're seeing from the administration. Lindsay? Right. Lots of change and back and forth is right. Okay, Steve Osinsami, thanks so much for your reporting as always. A rough day on Wall Street today. Stocks closing sharply lower. The Dow Jones Industrial Average tumbling more than 500 points to land just above 27,000 points. That's a loss of 1.8 percent. The S&P also fell, dropping 1.2 percent. Today, both were on the verge of correction territory. The dimming hopes of a new stimulus plan from Washington and fears of a second wave of the virus, both here and in Europe, contributed to the sell-off.
The Department of Justice has identified New York, Portland, and Seattle as, quote, anarchist jurisdictions. And the move comes as, the, as a request of President Trump, who aims to strip federal funding from cities that permit anarchy, violence, and destruction, or have taken steps to defund the police. The mayors of all three cities say the move is unlawful and unconstitutional, and they all vow to fight it in court. And when we come back, the mother speaking out after she and her two-year-old were bumped off of a flight because the child would not wear a mask, which she now wants airlines to do. The states of emergency as yet another tropical system takes aim at the Gulf Coast. More than a foot of rain expected in some areas. We'll have the forecast and an on-the-ground report. But up next, the small army of attorneys working to ensure that everyone who wants to vote can do so and have their vote counted. Stay with us. Most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smarten up. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail. Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, it's a major. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for the thing. With so much on the line, ABC News, America's number one news, is right there for you live on Hulu with stories of strength, stories of hope. Because now, when it matters most, Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. And that news is ABC News. ABC News Live on Hulu. ABC News Live on Hulu. Watch the news you need. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Streaming to all Hulu subscribers right now. <laughs> when your animal is in trouble, you need someone incredible. The Incredible Dr. Pole, new episode Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. Louisville's police chief is declaring a state of emergency for his department in advance of the Kentucky Attorney General's update on whether or not charges may be filed in the Breonna Taylor case. Taylor, as you remember, was gunned down inside her home by Louisville police officers who were executing a no-knock warrant. Sources tell ABC News a decision could happen this week as we're learning that six Louisville Metro police officers are under investigation by the department's professional standards unit for their role in the shooting. Election Day is just 43 days away, and tomorrow is National Voter Registration Day. So we're taking a closer look at the small army of legal volunteers standing by right now to help you navigate those near constant changes in voting rules and procedures this year. As Devin Dwyer reports, the pandemic may have upended our routines, but it's not stopping a major effort now underway to ensure that everyone who wants to vote still can. So, Krista, this would be the nerve center of the election protection hotline in an ordinary election. In an ordinary election, but these are not ordinary times. The voter call center at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law is normally buzzing, as we saw back in 2018. This is where thousands of volunteers this season, election season, are fielding phone calls seven days a week. Take a look. And can I have your name? And what are you calling about today? In 2020, with a tidal wave of voting changes caused by COVID, the virtual hotline is busier than ever before. Kristen Clark, who oversees the program, is one of the nation's top nonpartisan election lawyers. We tend to get a lot of calls from black voters, from Latinos and Native American voters who face disproportionate rates of voter suppression and voting discrimination. We tend to get lots of calls from states like Georgia and Texas and North Carolina. An army of 12,000 nonpartisan volunteer lawyers 
workers are working the hotline from home. More than double the number signed up to field calls four years ago. We've gotten calls in the tens of thousands, and we definitely have seen a shift. We definitely are getting more calls from people who are trying to figure out how to vote absentee for the first time. Nadine Montpremier is working nightly shifts from her Brooklyn apartment. And I'm going to give you a little peek into what a remote hotline looks like. I have my laptop and I have my monitor here. When you call the hotline, we are not selling you anything. We are very focused on what is your need? Why are you calling? Are you calling to find out if you're registered? Are you calling because you had an issue at the poll? Are you calling because of voter intimidation? What are some of the biggest concerns you're hearing right now from voters? People whose names have been removed from the polls. So let's say you voted in 10 elections and you decided not to vote in 2016 and you tried to vote in 2018 or you're trying to vote in 2020, but your state or your local uh, board of elections has removed you from um, the, the polls because you missed one election. Six states have so-called use-it-or-lose-it laws that cancel registrations of inactive voters. All states are required to clear out voters who have died, moved, or otherwise become ineligible. At least 17 million people removed from state registration lists between 2016 and 2018 alone. Advocates say making sure your registration is up-to-date and active is a key step to take right now. Oftentimes, uh, folks you know, think about it a, a little bit too late in the game. And so what's good this year is that we have had a lot of calls early, you know, in advance of registration deadlines with people just making sure. Thank you for calling Election Protection. This is John. John Bennett has helped voters on the hotline for 12 years. Certainly the, the, the lead up to the election is, is a lot busier than we typically are. Have you gotten a lot of questions about the Postal Service? There's definitely been folks calling in expressing some level of concern with the Postal Service given everything that's in the news. Uh, our advice is just uh, if you do want to vote by mail, uh, request your ballot as soon as you can. Raising the stakes, a tide of misinformation about mail-in voting. As now 45 states plus D.C. allow anyone to vote absentee this election as a result of COVID-19. President Trump sowing confusion by recently suggesting that voters who mail their ballots this year should show up in person on Election Day to vote again if their ballot isn't already in the system. But it's never legal to vote twice. And that's correct. And there's a swirl of unfounded claims about fraud. Voting by mail has been a regular part of American elections since the Civil War. Is there a particularly pernicious piece of misinformation that has really kind of started to take hold? I'd say probably the absentee ballot piece, um, whether voting by mail, whether the votes will count. I know we've gotten mm -hmm. a lot of questions of, if I mail my ballot in, will, will my vote count? What do you whether, say? Yes. <laughs> if it is mailed by a certain date and postmarked, um, it will count. And that, that is your vote. Just It's a matter of also making sure that you sign, because a lot of the reasons why... Um, the mail-in ballots may be uh, rejected, our signatures. And so remembering to sign it at the bottom. Voter advocates are confident a historic surge in mail ballots this year can produce a fair election outcome, but many worry that some voters might miss out. Make a plan now. Um, you know, don't get uh, caught by a deadline that snuck up on you that locks you out from absentee voting. Make sure you know the deadline for getting registered to vote. Make sure you know when early voting is happening in your state. This year, we're encouraging people to not so much think about November 3rd as Election Day, but really think about October as election season. A season that starts with getting registered to vote. For ABC News Live, I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. Our thanks to Devin for that. And if you have questions about voting this year, that hotline number is 1-866-OUR-VOTE. Still ahead here on Prime, the new round of evacuations from one of the largest fires in California history. Ellen has returned to TV during a swirl of negative accusations surrounding the workplace culture on her show, what she had to say about it all. And we've heard so much about how much or how little time there may be to confirm a justice with just 43 days until the next election. We'll drill down on the history of confirmations, how long it's taken before. But first, our post of the day, 24-year-old Emmy winner Zendaya making history. 
In times like these, the newsmaking events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face to face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong Un. The president. You trust him? I do trust him. Yeah, I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you. No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. And returning now to the battle over the Supreme Court vacancy left by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we took a closer look by the numbers at the historic precedent for nominating and confirming Supreme Court justices during an election year. Since 1800, there have been only 13 election year Supreme Court vacancies, and only six of them were filled the same year. But never, talking about zero times, has a Senate nomination and confirmation happened this close to an election. In all of American history, only two Supreme Court vacancies came closer to Election Day, and in both instances, replacement nominations happened after Election Day. On average, it takes about 70 days from a Supreme Court nomination to a final Senate vote, but for the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, it took only 42 days. President Trump is expected to announce a nominee late this week, about 40 days before the election. Still lots to get to here on Prime. The NYPD officer arrested and accused of acting as an agent for China. And later, our conversation with faith leaders as our nation grapples with the unimaginable 200,000 lives lost to COVID-19. But first, here's a look at some of the trending stories on abcnews.com. Migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So, this is the fourth weekend of protest. <laughs> Watch ABC News on location for Facebook Watch. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail. Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
just a little over six weeks until the November election, two issues in 2020 could tip the scales and ultimately decide who wins the White House. We're going to fill the seat. After the passing of iconic liberal Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, President Trump is vowing to fill her seat before Election Day. The Senate has more than sufficient time to process the nomination. Last Friday, we lose Ruth Bader Ginsburg. What an amazing woman, discriminated against because of her gender over and over, but she never gave up, never gave up, ultimately being Pointed to the federal court and then to the highest court in the land where she continued her battle for everyone, especially for women, to be treated equally. Justice Ginsburg's body will lie at the Supreme Court Wednesday and Thursday and then at the U.S. Capitol on Friday. A private interment service next week at Arlington National Cemetery is also planned. The Bobcat fire more than doubling in size from last week. According to the LA Times, it is now one of LA County's largest wildfires in history. Putting as many resources as we possibly can in that fire. Over 105,000 acres and only 15% contained, the blaze has left a path of destruction in the San Gabriel Mountains. Flames inching within a few hundred feet of the Mount Wilson Observatory, home to Southern California's TV towers. Fire officials say the earliest they expect full containment is the end of the month. What am I supposed to do? I never act like this, but I'm a woman. I'm so bad to my mother. I don't know what to do. Rachel Starr Davis had been on a work trip in Florida when Hurricane Sally moved in. She was finally able to get a flight home to New Hampshire when her child wouldn't wear a mask. exhausted and I was explaining to the gate manager we were not failing to comply with your policy I can't force my two-year-old to wear a mask that, that doesn't even fit his face at some point common sense and human decency has to come in and you say a two-year-old you cannot reason with and so these policies need to give room for that they need to give room for some flexibility American Airlines tells ABC News to ensure the safety of our customers and team American Airlines requires all persons two years and older to wear an appropriate face covering. We've reached out to the family to learn more and to address their concerns. Welcome to season 18 of the Ellen DeGeneres Show. Today, Ellen DeGeneres addressing allegations that behind the scenes of her show was a toxic work environment. I learned that things happened here that never should have happened. I take that very seriously, and I want to say I am so sorry to the people who were affected. She offered an apology to her audience and applauded the people on her staff. I am a boss of 270 people. 270 people who helped make this show what it is. 270 people I am so grateful for. It. Musical artist Bad Bunny stopped New York City traffic with a surprise concert, and his stage was a moving bus. Bad Bunny took the party from Yankee Stadium to Harlem. The show ended outside of Harlem Hospital, where he gave a tribute performance dedicated to healthcare workers. Bad Bunny also marked the third anniversary of Hurricane Maria making landfall in his native Puerto Rico. Welcome back. Next to the state of emergency along the Gulf Coast as yet another storm prepares to make landfall in Texas. Take a look at slow-moving tropical storm Beta. The Galveston area has already been inundated with heavy rain and is under a flood threat. Matt Gutman has the latest. Tropical storm Beta slowly swamping South Texas. Water rising in parts of Galveston, streets submerged. We are going to be on the dirty side of the storm system at least through Wednesday. The season's 23rd named storm churning surf that wrenched away part of the popular 61st Street Pier in Galveston. It washed up on shore hundreds of yards away. This is the seawall that divides Galveston from the Gulf of Mexico. Now, down these stairs and about 50 yards in that direction is where the shoreline used to be but now it's been consumed by that storm surge. Beta stirring huge swells in the Gulf, captured by a boat engineer while servicing rigs over the weekend. And that storm surge already inundating Surfside Beach on Sunday, Texas and Louisiana both declaring states of emergency for Beta. 
Hey, Lindsay, I actually want you to see the uh, latest tourist attraction here in Galveston. It was actually ripped from the jetty, which you might see a few hundred yards away. You can see the splintered wood here, but not much damage here in Galveston or in Texas. But what we're going to see over the next 48 hours or so is Beta slowly grind its way up the Texas and Louisiana coasts, going right over the area that Hurricane Laura hammered with rain and winds. There are still 40,000 people in that area without power right now. Lindsay. Just a one-two punch. All right, Matt, our thanks to you. And Ginger Z is tracking the storm for us. Ginger, another huge rainmaker during this exceptionally busy hurricane season. Lindsay, it's already been a slow mover and going to slow down even more. Beta very near landfall, already pushing a ton of water, as you saw, toward that Texas coast. But now it's going to be dropping the water. So as it makes landfall, I want you to take a look at those tropical storm warnings that go all the way from Matagorda Bay over through Louisiana. So south central Louisiana, including Cameron, included Lake Charles that got hit so hard by Laura in a flash flood watch all the way to nearly New Orleans. So keep an eye on all of this water as it starts to to drop and drop slowly. As I mentioned, it's through tonight, tomorrow, and even on Wednesday. Thursday is just barely a low that's trying to make its way out of Louisiana. So we'll be dealing with what's left of beta for a couple of days. At best, though, the gusts will be 35 to 40 miles per hour. I really think it's going to be where those heavy bands set up. So 6 to 10 inches, kind of just north of Bolivar Peninsula, uh, just north and east of Houston. So watch that as you're traveling up to Louisiana. Then we have to check on Teddy, a true hurricane still out there in the Atlantic. It looks like it'll impact directly Canada. But here along the East Coast, anywhere from South Carolina to Maine, you could see some high surf and waves 7 to 13 feet. Lindsay? Wow. All right, Ginger, our thanks to you. An NYPD, of NYPD officer has been arrested and is being accused of acting as an agent and taking orders from Chinese government officials at the consulate in New York. Authorities say the community affairs officer allegedly offered to give them inside information about the NYPD, gave them access to senior police officials, and reported on activities of Tibetans living in New York City. The officer also serves as an Army reservist at Fort Dix. And a suspect has been arrested for allegedly sending President Trump a letter laced with potentially deadly ricin. The suspect appeared in federal court in Buffalo today. The FBI arrested her as she tried to enter the U.S. from Canada. The letter, according to investigators, was intercepted at an off-site mail facility. And when we return, marking America's grim milestone, 200,000 dead, and squaring that loss with faith. Stay with us. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Cross my office up the list. What if we pick for each other? Stop. Yes. ABC News honored winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor, overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. Now, with so much on the line, ABC News, America's number one news, is right there for you live on Hulu with stories of strength, stories of hope. Because now, when it matters most, Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. And that news is ABC News. ABC News Live on Hulu. ABC News Live on Hulu. Watch the news you need. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Streaming to all Hulu subscribers right now. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward.
You hear the bells there tolling at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. 200 times over a 20 minute period to mark the 200,000 Americans who have lost their lives to COVID-19. 200,000 lives lost, but more than a number. David Muir reports on who they were. Dr. Adeline Fagan from Syracuse, New York. She was just 28 years old and she had dreamed of being a doctor since she was a little girl. She was playing operation and trying to fix up her dolls and she held on to that goal and she went for it. Dr. Adeline Marie Fagan. When she walked across the stage, and we were just beside ourselves so proud because, you know, it was her dream. She was starting her second year of residency in Houston, delivering babies during the pandemic and treating COVID patients in the ER. She started feeling sick and then fought the virus for two months, her parents traveling to Texas. My mom told me that when she had to leave, she said to Adeline, Adeline, I love you, and she kissed her. And Adeline is, you know, um, boopy as she was, made a kissy face back at my mom. And so we know that she she knew that she was loved and that we were there and even to lend. There have been so many families forever changed. Helen Jones Woods, a trombone player. She was a founding member of the International Sweethearts of Rhythm. That's her on the right. Do you want to jump children? Yeah! The Sweethearts were the first integrated all-female big band, touring the country in the Jim Crow era and during World War II. We had breakfast at 6 o'clock and we started rehearsing at 7. We rehearsed all day, you know. In Florida, Kimora Lynam was just nine years old. They called her Kimmy. She was going into the fourth grade this year when she got sick. Her mother, Mikasha. She was very talkative and just really, really happy. She made friends very easily. She was perfect. Jermaine Stevens was a defensive lineman at California University of Pennsylvania. He would have turned 21 years old today. He died of a pulmonary embolism. 10 days after testing positive for COVID. We were sitting in the hospital talking about COVID responsible kinds of celebration that we could do for his birthday. So to go from that to get to the hospital the next day and he's gone. In South Carolina, 28 year old Demetria Bannister, a third grade teacher singing during a field trip with her students. She made this video for her students last year. Yeah, I'm on my way to Windsor. But this year, just a week after the start of virtual classes, she tested positive and she died three days later. Tyler Emberge was 29, a youth hockey coach in North Texas. He began playing hockey at just seven, and it was through hockey he would meet his wife, Amy. He always wanted his players to be stand-up human beings on the ice and off the ice. He left behind a young daughter, Riley, and two youth teams mourning their coach. There's the coach right there. Bill Yeoman was the winningest coach in the University of Houston's history, winning 160 games, four Southwest Conference championships, and leading the Cougars to 11 bowl appearances. There was that surprise win at the Cotton Bowl in 1980. It is history here at the Cotton Bowl, and Houston has rallied. His son, Bill. When he gave his word, he, he gave it. He meant it. So when he told a recruit, that he uh, would be there to coach him, he wasn't kidding. He got many offers to leave U of H for a whole lot of money, and his answer every time was, I told these players I would be here when I recruited him, and that's what he did. Yeoman was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame in 2001. In California, Brenda Sanchez fought COVID-19 alongside her mother, Jesus. Brenda made it through, her mother did not. Her mother was just 54 years old, her family singing her happy birthday. <laughs> Joanne Reck had long worked as a nurse. She was living in a retirement community in Florida when she got sick. And when she was taken to the hospital, her 90-year-old husband, Sam, getting into full PPE to see her yeah, one saying, last time. You don't recognize me with all this junk on my face. It is Sam. I love you, sweetheart. 
to that. <laughs> I love you so much. They were married for 30 years. Finally getting to hold, hold your hand after all these months. Brian Sadler from Ringwood, New Jersey. He worked as a paramedic for 36 years on 9-11, racing to ground zero, his son Thomas. He used to tell people, no one dies on my ambulance, no one dies in my hospital, no one dies under me. It was last year, at 60 years old, Brian fulfilled his dream of becoming an ICU nurse. Then the pandemic, and he was right there on the front lines. Isabel Papa Dimitriou was just a year away from retirement after 30 years as a respiratory therapist at a Dallas hospital. She went into work bravely, despite knowing how dangerous it was, and she kept going in. Her daughter telling us she would always send gifts and messages and videos. Lots of kisses, bye-bye. Isabel became a grandmother last year, and it was fitting that the grandmother who had sent so many gifts the last gift arriving after she passed away for her granddaughter, Lua, a pair of shoes. I want Lua to know that my mom was a hero and that she stopped at nothing to be there for others. Our thanks to David. As our country deals with what would have been unthinkable but just months ago, 200,000 Americans dead from COVID-19, we thought we'd check in with three faith leaders to see how their communities are handling this challenging time and the grief, of course, that comes along with it. Joining us now, Reverend Johnny Green, who presides over a Baptist church in Harlem, New York, Imam W. Dean Sharif, an imam in Irvington, New Jersey, and Rabbi Rachel Ain, who leads a synagogue in Manhattan. Thank you all so much for your time. Uh, of course, community is so important to the grieving process. How challenging have these past six months been for, for each of you and your faith communities, especially given your limited ability to see people face to face? I'd like to start with you, Reverend Green. I understand your congregation has lost 13 members to COVID. Absolutely. Thank you for having me today. Uh, certainly, we are still rebounding from such a significant loss in our congregation. Uh, we have continued to do uh, our worship and our total uh, church ministry uh, virtually. Uh, we have lifted some restrictions. We, on last week, we um, made it possible to have funeral services at our church with a limited number of participants. And, and Rabbi Ain, same question to you, just to kind of give us a sense of, of the challenges in the past few months. So over the last several months, um, there there has been there have been members of our community who have lost loved ones to COVID um, and from other diseases. And over these last several months, we've had to engage in virtual shivas, um, virtual funerals. We are keeping the the mantra via Hafilarecha Kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself, front and center. So we're taking a conservative, small C approach to how we engage in worship, having nobody at the synagogue. How we've had to say goodbye to people over these last six months is a complete anathema to how Judaism normally engages in mourning rituals. Normally we're together as a community, burying a person as soon as possible. We've been using technology as best as possible and we're trying to remember people. And Imam Sharif, the same question to you, just the difficulty and, and how you've been coping the last few months. Well, thank you for inviting me to express some concerns that we have about what is happening in the United States of America and in our hearts. And certainly our condolences go out to all of the family members who have lost members of their family and friends to this COVID-19 disease, the 200,000 that we are affecting the lives of people. And what we attempt to do is again, reach out as my, as my colleagues in faith have in, had said, we reach out on the basis of ma'um, which we call neighborly needs. And we try to provide social services in the form of food for people that may need meals, money that people sometimes will need in order to pay their rent. All of these are factors that we have to take into consideration. And most of all, we try and provide some compassionate psychological relief to people in the form of providing social uh, networking that is associated with delivering messages that will hopefully give people hope in the midst of all of this despair. And Imam, while I, I have you, just would ask you, 
as you try to be a, a pillar of strength in your own community, who or what uh, do you lean on in particular as a source of strength for you? Well, our, our primary source of strength, of course, is God. And the means by which we, we begin to get that source of strength, of course, is primarily through prayer. And so for us in the Muslim community, you know, we have a prescription of praying five times a day. And of course, this COVID-19 situation has limited our access to not only being able to come out to the mosque for the five prayers, and we're checking on each other. So that's the most important factor is to make sure that we can lean on each other, we can lean on God, and we can lean on the book that is associated with giving guidance to our faith. And Rabbi Ain, the same question to you, if there's a, a particular person, a particular prayer um, uh, that you have relied on and, and leaned on and leaned into during this time. Well, I think I've leaned into our morning and afternoon and evening prayers, similar to what the Imam said, the idea that we come together on a routine, a ritualized basis, even though people aren't coming together physically, we've been able to remain connected virtually to say the morning M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, morning prayers, and the M-O-R-N-I-N-G, morning prayers together. The ability to think about what are the prayers that we're trying to lift up. Over the last month, we've been um, sounding the shofar, the ram's horn, as a call to action that where we are right now as a world is not where we want to be. And we need to use that shofar, that sound, to change our own ways to, and to know where we need to go and then to think where are we going as a community. And so being able to uh, rely on the scientists and doctors in my community has also been a tremendous source of strength for me. And Rabbi, while I have you as well, of course our country uh, continues to mourn all of these lives and so many right now in particular uh, are mourning the passing of RBG. Is, is there a religious significance of her dying as the sun set to begin Rosh Hashanah and begin the new year, the new beginning? Uh, the loss of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was so painful for for all of us as Americans, no matter where you are in the political spectrum. Her tenacity um, and what she gave to so many in this country in terms of equality is something that can't be understated. And having her die on Erev Rosh Hashanah, the Hebrew phrase of the evening, right before, means two things for me. First of all, there's the notion that she lived the life of a tzaddik, of a righteous, anyone who died right before Rosh Hashanah is known as that. The other thing is on Rosh Hashanah, we ask to be written in the book of life. And that means that last year, RBG was written for an entire complete year. She was given the fullness of a year to live out her life. And I hope that we can live on her values. And Reverend Green, uh, of course, you know, all too well as we go back to the idea of this pandemic hitting uh, black Americans especially hard. You've said that you've never seen anything like this. How do you help your congregation make sense out of all the loss at this time? Well, um, you know, my colleagues who are on the line uh, in ministry with me today, they have both stated uh, one of the main major tenets of our faith is prayer. And uh, we do a lot of praying in our congregation. I do a lot of personal uh, praying. And just knowing uh, that this world uh, is not the only uh, world that we have hope in. You know, the scripture says, if in this world only we have hope, we are men and women most miserable. And so our hope is built on nothing less than, and than the love of God and his righteousness. And uh, we draw strength from our uh connection with Christ. And Imam, uh, next question to you, and, and we'll probably end here, but we just heard the Reverend talk about hope. And uh, of course, you've, you've all been talking about, you know, the word, how, how that gives you hope. For those who are, who are looking uh, for, for some hope right now, what, what would you say specifically, Imam? And one of the messages that we've been focusing on during this time of COVID-19 is what we call akhlaq. Akhlaq is the refinement of human character. And that is to developing the position of people with morals and ethics and character so that the best of our human character will shine through in the midst of all of this darkness. And I think that is the light that sometimes people are looking for. They're looking for someone to care. They're looking for someone to have empathy. And they're looking for someone that will bring them 
that sense of connection to the human family. And I believe that the message that you're delivering today is also a, a lifting of hope, meaning that you have three faiths coming together and you have three, three leaders of faiths that are coming together to deliver a message of hope that hopefully everybody within this universal family can relate to. The universal family is right. Rabbi Ain, we'll give you the last word here as far as those looking for hope. What do you say? Well, every week we say a prayer for our country, we say a prayer for peace. And somebody once said to me, Rabbi, why do we keep saying these prayers if we don't see a lot of change? And I said, the minute we stop praying is the minute we've lost all hope. So I'm going to continue to pray those words. I'm going to continue to hope for change. And then I'm going to get to work with my fellow community members to make tomorrow better than today. Our faith leaders in our universal family, we thank you so much for your wisdom and for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And before we go tonight, our image of the day, a statue of a fearless girl with a lace collar honoring a fearless woman. This is one of so many tributes that we're seeing this week as Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is remembered. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and good night.